afternoon. Welcome to this webinar entitled Politics, Power, and Profession, Social Work Through the Eyes of Feminist Historians. This webinar is an installment of an ongoing series on critical feminisms that Ophelia hosts every quarter. I am Jessica Toft, and I will be moderating today's conversation. I am an associate professor at the University of Minnesota School of Social Work and the vice president of the Social Welfare History Group and a member of the Ophelia Editorial Board. Before I begin, I would like to recognize Ophelia for creating this space for such a forum. I would also like to thank the Social Welfare History Group for co-sponsoring this event and welcome its members. Finally, I would like to thank my institution, the University of Minnesota and the School of Social Work for providing the webinar capabilities for the event and the ongoing support of social welfare historical research. Um, um, as the land-based host of the event, the School of Social Work at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities acknowledges the Dakota people who are the first people of Minnesota Makache. The Dakota people have an ancient historical and spiritual connection to the land in which the University of Minnesota Twin Cities was built and remains. It is essential to acknowledge that this land was never, was never ceded by the Dakota people. We at the School of Social Work commit ourselves to actions and practices that address the injustices from which our school benefits. Um, a bit about housekeeping. To turn on captions for this webinar, go to more captions and, so, and show captions. Um, also, the chat is disabled. So please put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll save time for Q&A at the end of the webinar. Uh, this is being recorded and will be available on Ophelia YouTube channel. This webinar is timely. Sarah uh, Maza, who wrote Thinking About History, states, history changes all the time because it is driven by the concerns of the present. It is what the present needs to know about the past. Let's take just one such example. According to Education Week, 18 states have signed into law restrictions about teaching critical race theory in public education at various levels. And according to the ACLU's CRT Forward site, there are currently 567 anti-CRT measures introduced at local, state, and federal levels. Similar measures have been adopted to ban or limit the discussion of transgender rights and abortion rights in the university classrooms. According to the Chronicle of Higher Education in Florida, uh, and a, in an effort to eliminate the college's diversity spending, Governor Ron DeSantis' office has requested that state colleges and universities list their spending on programs related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and critical race theory. Florida's House Speaker, Paul Renner, later asked the same campuses to turn over significant additional DEI-related information. In a related move, DeSantis' office also requested that state universities report data on transgender students and give university presidents more power in hiring faculty. The Chronicle has coined these tactics, the Ed Scare. The information requested by these government officials is inherently historical in nature. Racism, which critical race theory centers, is embedded within our systems and institutions, codified in law, and threaded into American public policy. Racial inequality is reproduced and maintained over time. Indeed, an analysis of how human interactions unfold over time is historians' distinctive contribution to the social sciences, according to William uh, Sowell. Maza argues that in democracies, citizens want to hear the story of the people. And there is growing interest in social welfare history, especially among young uh, social work faculty and PhD students, as it allows a platform for those who've been excluded from the nationalist American script. Minorities, women, queer and transgender people, disabled persons, immigrants and refugees, working people and persons of poverty. Along these lines, the Social Welfare History Group, uh, established in 1956, has been reinvigorated. Among its new work are historical bi biographies on pandemics and social work, police and social work, and the just released Red Scares political repression and social work, why now? And as Mimi Abramovitz writes in the introduction, red scares describe the times in US history when a group or the government itself seeking to uphold class, race, and gender status quo publicly identifies and undermines their political opponents by calling them communists, socialists, anarchists, or subversives 
and accusing them of disloyalty to the United States. Panics over progressive political ideas and critiques of the status quo continue to generate backlash and repression in the United States. Authors of the bibliography researched three periods, the first Red Scare, the Great Depression, and the second Red Scare in the McCarthy era. And each period introduce, introduces, refines, and alters tactics of Red Scare. And the trajectory of Red Scares continues with this contemporary Ed Scare as we see similar yet new and distinct ways of, lever of leveraging legislation, popular support, regulation, more local government units, institutional surveillance, and limits to academic freedom as tools of political repression. So as we hear about historical research through the eyes of feminist historians, we will have a front row seat to their journeys and their motivations and perspectives of their work and what history has to offer social work in general. And I'm sure this will be a mind expanding and exciting experience. So in the spirit of these first uh, critical feminist webinars, we are so pleased to have three preeminent, preeminent historians with us today. And I would like to welcome, welcome them now. All right, so if I could have Dr. Mimi Abramovitz is a Bertha Capron Reynolds Professor Emerita of Social Policy. And uh, Mimi, if you could come on camera for us, uh, that would be great. And uh, at Silverman School of Social Work, Hunter College and the Cooney Graduate Center. A longtime feminist, her research interests include women, US welfare state, poverty, inequality, activism, and the impact of public policy on human service organizations all viewed through the lens of class, systemic racism, and structural patriarchy. She is the author of four books, among them, Regulating the Lives of Women, Social Welfare Policy from Colonial Times to the Present, the award-winning Under Attack, Fighting Back, Women and Welfare in the US, and she's currently writing Gendered Obligations, the history of activism on, among Black and white working class women since 1900. Mimi was an early member of the Philia editorial board and currently co-leads the National Social Worker Voter Mobilization Campaign, also known as Voting as Social Work. Um, and Mimi has received many deserved lifetime awards for her prolific scholarly contributions. Dr. Susan P. Kemp, we'd like to have you join us. She is professor of the school, uh, professor of social work at the University of Auckland and Charles O'Cressy endowed professor emerita at the University of Washington School of Social Work. And her research interests focus on place, environment, and community as foci of social work practice. Low-income children, youth and families, public child welfare, and social work history and theory. Uh, for social work and research, she has been, um, I'm sorry, uh, she's a fellow of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare and the Society for Social Work and Research. And she has been invested in social work history since undertaking her doctoral research at Columbia University under the brilliant mentorships of professors Carol Meyer and Barbara Simon. And uh, Dr. Yusun Park, welcome. She is an associate professor at University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice. A significant portion of Dr. Park's work consists of histories of the present critical analyses of the profession's past intended to elucidate the profession's current practices and future imaginaries. Her award-winning historical work includes the reconstruction of occluded history of social work compl uh, complicity and the forced removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, and an examination of the profession's participation in the Americanization movement, which established that white supremacy was a constitutive rather than a marginal element of the development of social work. Dr. Park has also provided significant and dedicated service to Affilia as its past editor in chief. Um, and uh, I also just wanted to mention quickly that Dr. Iris Carlton Linnea was invited and had planned to join us, but she could not make it due to um, unforeseen events. Uh, Dr. Carlton Linnea was an editorial board member for Affilia for eight years, and she also has been an active member of the Social Welfare History Group. So we will be citing some of her work in the chat during the program to recognize her amazing contributions to social work and social welfare history. And now I would like to start by um, posing our panelists some questions. Um, and so here is the first question. And um, uh, Dr. Abramovitz, I was hoping you could start us off. The first question is, how did you come to be a social work historian and in what ways do you see your work as feminist in nature? I think you're muted, Mimi.
Um, thank you. And that was a lovely introduction to the whole project, Jessica. Thank you very much. And um, I'm happy to start us off. So but first I have to confess that my high school history classes turned me off to history. So that when I went to college, because it was all dates and memorization. So I went to college, um, I didn't take much history, much to my chagrin later on. But I was also a child of the 60s. I am also a child of the 60s. And I was active in the anti-war, the civil rights <clears throat> and the women's liberation movement. So this exposed me to ideas and activists who showed me, taught me the role and value of history. My dissertation was called the, the, the Role of Business in the Campaign for Health Insurance During the Progressive Era. Um, and then um, right after that, shortly after that, I wrote a book called Regulating the Lives of Women, which was mentioned before from colonial times to the present. And I'm now working on a book on the history of activism among poor and working class black and white women. So um, it was it was sort of an accident, maybe I should call myself an accidental historian, but I cannot understand the world without um, uh, that perspective. And I make sure that it's in my classes and in my writing. Um, and then what ways do I see my work as feminist? Is that was the next part of the question, right? Well, um, there are many types of feminism uh, and they often challenge each other. And so I participated in the women's movement and it raised my feminist consciousness. That was the beginning. Uh, and as and my participation in the civil rights and other movements shaped how I see feminism in two other ways. First, I developed a structural analysis focused on the social relations of power, rather than uh, male, white, and class domination to be more specific. Um, and I examined uh, social work and social policy through the lens, as Jessica mentioned, race, class, and gender, or what today we call intersectionality. Thank you so much, Mimi. Um, Dr. Kemp, I'm wondering if you can uh, follow up with your, with your uh, story. Thank you, Kiara Koto. I'm saying warmest greetings from uh, New Zealand, where it's morning and lovely. And thank you so much to the History Group and to Ophelia for providing an opportunity for this conversation. It's just such an important one, and, and it's so hard to make space for history. So thank you. Uh, much appreciation. Uh, like Mimi, I have to make a confession about high school, but it's the opposite one, which is that I was blessed as a senior in high school with a, with a brilliant historian who had us read real histories and not textbooks. And I, I just fell in love with history, but didn't do anything with it really until I arrived at Columbia and uh, to do my PhD with Carol Meyer and fortunately as mentioned Barbara Simon as well. And I was curious, I'd arrived in New York as a New Zealander who had been doing very place and community based sort of on the ground kinds of social work and who was very committed to the idea of social work as a profession around person and environment, this contextualized understanding of people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I arrived in New York and was doing pre diems and thinking, why won't they even let me out of the office? What happened to environment mm -hmm. in this framing of social work in New York City? Very particular, but I, I, I got intellectually curious about that and ended up doing an intellectual history of the concept of environment with Carol and Barbara's support and, and wonderful um, support from historians at Columbia. Um, trying to sort of understand the fortunes of this idea and how it traveled over time from the 1980s through to the, from the uh, 1800s through to the uh, 1900s when Carol and others were working on ecological systems theory. So um, I have been an historian in some ways with my left hand. Yeah, some ways with my left hand. Then. There we go. I think. Go keep continue, please, Susan. I don't know what happened. Something muted me. I apologize. Um, so I continue to do history when and as I can, and for me, it's a way of sort of uncovering the layers and things of sort of understanding the structural and power relations inside things that are apparently simple and taken for granted in every day. Um, and thinking about inclusion, about praxis, and um, 
certainly about critique, but critique that has a stake in the game that, that is invested in what it's taking on and tackling, uh, not just pulling it to bits. Wonderful. So uh, long answer to a shortish question. No, it's, it's, it's great to get us established and understand each of you as we continue up talking about your work. Dr. Park, I'm wondering if you can respond now. Um, so how did I come to be a social work historian? It's really simple. It was Susan Kemp. Um, uh, Susan um, was uh, on my um, committee, on my doctoral committee, and I'm a first generation immigrant and I was really already very interested in the history of immigration, um, especially because my lived reality and the, the national myth was so at odds. Um, so I was studying uh, immigration history and then I also was introduced to Foucault um, and the notion of uh, the history of the present. So to begin with, uh, present day problematics and to think about how do we get here and when and how do we illuminate um, our problems by looking at the past and um, so it's very 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 much interested in um, theoretical post structuralist work so I was all set to go and study really do a, a discourse analysis study and then Susan kept whispering you should go to hang out in the archives a bit um, I distinctly remember her saying you should go check out the um, the the proceedings of the national conference um, and so on. So I did, and um, I never left. Um, so in the beginning, I think I was thinking that I would go into history and study it enough so that I can make sense of um, how we got to where we got to. And then um, this is what I've been doing. And in part because during my dissertation process, I kept finding um, things that have been occluded in our, um, so, when I was doing my dissertation was when I first came across this, uh, the fact that um, every single person who was removed and um, incarcerated during World War II, Japanese Americans, had gone through social work hands. And I remember going to everybody and asking people, what did you know about this? And the only person who really knew about it was um, my chair, um, Tony Ishizaka, who had been born in a camp. So, and then um, my latest work on Americanization is was the same thing. I kept coming across this term Americanization and not seeing it anywhere um, in our historical text and, and finding it that way. Um, and in the way that I see my work as feminist is, is that um, I think it's really simply that, that doing this work, what I'm trying to resist is dominant interpretations. So in being critical and, and looking for epistemological stances and epistemological inroads into whatever it is that we're teaching and thinking and, um, and studying in the particular ways that we do by, um, by doing that. Um, and to you know, quote um, Bertha Cape and Reynolds, um, being a loyal critic of social work is how I think about my um, own feminist stance. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, just in listening to the three of you, it's so interesting how you come about power analysis sort of in slightly different ways, but that, that's a common theme uh, and that you, you claim that as, as part of your feminist uh, tradition is this, is this power analysis. Um, and so let's move along just because we've got a lot of great questions and, and it's so interesting to hear from you. Um, I'm hoping Dr. Kemp, you'll, you'll feel this one first. Um, what types of questions have you addressed? And in general, what is the historical research process like? Thanks, Jessica. I, I've already mentioned that sort of a core of my work has really been as an intellectual historian. And I guess that's really my DNA, wanting to sort of understand the shape of ideas, again, influenced by um, a Foucauldian perspective that knowledge and power intersect, that ideas are powerful in their own right and that they frame how we think and that they shape how we do and that we're deeply uh, engaged with them in ways that we often don't think about. So thinking about the environment was one way I've done that. I've had the great pleasure of working uh, with Ruth, Ruth Brandwine on a, on a histories of feminisms in social work um, for, for Ophelia. And I have found um, myself in different ways, including in work with Yusun, which has just been amazing to do, um, working on sort of thinking about the legacies, complexities, contradictions, and invisibilization in many ways of the work of early women pioneers in social work 
um, both um, women partnered women, but also work on the women's work of the um, infant mortality campaign of the Children's Bureau of women, many of whom were but not only first, but second generation Hull House women. And um, Yusan and I working on sort of critical examination of um, work with immigrants at the turn of the um, 20th century. So, um, and I'm very interested in sort of finding time to continue that work and think about social works history of urban environmentalism as we move into an era of climate change and, and massive, uh, destruction on all fronts coming with that. What's it like to do history? I, I think it's both incredibly solitary, um, but also gives you this, we've been talking about all of our own connections with each other. It, it gives you this wonderful intellectual network. But in terms of the actual day-to-day -day work, I always think of, again, Foucault, who wrote about genealogy and genealogical work, and I'm going to quote him. He said, genealogy is gray, meticulous, and patiently documentary. It operates on a field of entangled and confused parchments on documents that have been scratched over and recopied many times. So it's this, for me, it's this sort of patient piecing together of different sort of textual fragments and trying to sort of unpack the layers in them and then have deep conversations with people like you, son, about what it all means. Um, so it's both joyous and tedious. <laughs> That's Joyous and Tedious. That's the name of the next webinar in history, <laughs> uh, procedural methods. Um, Yusun, I'm wondering if you can take that question next. What types of questions have you addressed? And in general, what's the historical research process like? Um, if I really had to characterize um, my body of work, and, and I think what I'm looking at is um, what's included, what kind of histories have been covered up in social work, so whose voices have been covered up, but also um, what are the sort of persistent slippages in its, uh, the profession's intent and its, its actual outcome, um, and trying to write histories about the work that we've done and the, and the people that we've been in ways that are really complex. Um, because I think it's really easy to think about certain parts of social work is, um, more innocent than others. And I you know, go back to Foucault's notion that nobody is innocent. Um, and that we need to think about uh, people's motivations and um, uh, in, in very different ways than say, to say this was good, this was bad. Um, so that's one thing. And you know, topically I've covered um, a lot of uh, different immigration populations, um, but really the process of othering and the ways in which social work as a profession has been involved in, in formulating the other um, is, is, and what the historical research process is like for me is um, uh, demoralizing often, um, time consuming. Uh, I feel a lot of um, anxiety um, and I'll be really truthful about this. Um, you know, doing historical work, which takes a really long time. Um, and I often, I mean, I, I try to explain it as, you know, I, if there's one thing that I can say on the paper that requires maybe you know, a week, two weeks, a month's work to figure out, and that doesn't show up on the page. So in social work where productivity um, of certain kind is really valued, um, I think I spend a lot of time um, feeling like I'm getting nothing done um, when I am actually doing a lot of work. So there's a lot of anxiety involved in it. And, and you know, more than the professional bit, I think is, um, the sense that I never know enough. So um, every time I try to interpret a phenomenon or interpret some text, I'm thinking, okay, I need to know about that now because um, there's always so much uh, that I don't know. So um, it's really fun detective work, but at the same time, it is um, anxiety provoking in those ways. Yes, almost like the sense that the historian needs to understand the whole context and all the possible uh, influencing um, pieces to explain or to present something well. Yes, right. But and and at the same time, then you have to figure out how do you know when you haven't when how do you know that what you call context is the context, right? So it's kind of this infinitely um, expanding um, and infinitely sort of descending um, project, I guess. Yes. Stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Yusin. Uh, uh, Mimi, what's your perspective? What types of questions have you addressed? And what is the historical research process like for you? Okay. Well, my, my uh, 
my focus has been on questions related to social policy and the US welfare state rather than individuals. I just say that because social work does the opposite usually, except for the people in this room. <clears throat> um, and so I ask how have, the, how have the structures of patriarchy, systemic racism and economic inequality, how have they been embedded in the US welfare state and social welfare policy? And how have they em, 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 affected impacted the welfare, welfare state workers and clients, since I focus on the workers and the clients at different times. Um, and um, so I say I examine the social relations of the welfare state. The early welfare state scholars tended to focus on the dynamics of class markets and men, and they were, most of them were men. There were very few women at that time. Um, the research was useful. It produced a lot of useful uh, information, but it failed to notice what the, that the welfare state treated people differently based on race, class, and gender. So when feminists started to take a look at the welfare state through this gender lens, they learned one, that women reformers played a central role in the origins of the welfare state. Two, that women comprise the majority of welfare state clients and workers. And three, that the welfare state enforced both the division of labor that kept women in their place. So they brought women into view, is how I offered to say it, which, which hadn't been done before. Um, but I also e examine the welfare state as a site of political struggle. While it controls women, it, has, it also has a liberatory potential. So we all know about the control, regulating the lives of women. My book is all about the control side. But there also is an unexpected, I think, and largely unrecognized liberatory potential that can turn the welfare state into a site of political struggle, which it should be. So rather than focus on dependency, as the critics say, like a strike fund, cash benefits or access to them, or what some call the social wage, um, supports individual autonomy and women's unpaid reproductive labor in the home. So when income is available outside the market, it can increase the bargaining power of workers versus employers, say through unions, women versus men, and people of color versus white, the white power structure. And then when I talk about this, I often say, no wonder government keeps welfare benefits so low, because redressing the balance of power is not what the welfare state is about, um, it's maintaining the existing status quo. Um, and in terms of the historical research process, I kind of echo what the you, son, and uh, Susan have said. Um, for some reason, I look at the long sweeps of history, which most historians disapprove of. They recommend shorter biographies, studies of organizations, and so on. But that's why I really enjoy the process of synthesizing this material. I don't know where that came from, but that's what happened to me. Um, so I do a lot of secondary analysis because you can't go into archives and letters when you're doing 200 years. Um, so, but I did learn um, some errors that to watch out for, and then I began to watch out for, um, in, guided in part by Clark Chambers uh, from the University of uh, Minnesota way back when. Um, and, but one, one error is what, to watch out for reproducing errors that are built into prior account, historical accounts. There are certain things about a social work history, I'm sure, that are repeated over and over again in all the traditional accounts, and they're probably wrong or you know, not purposely wrong, but just wrong. Um, and then there's, so those are general errors, dates, times, people, events, but there's also um, omissions, biases and distortions, which have already been referred to, especially related to marginalized populations. And so um, the work is tedious, I'll echo that word. It's uh, troubling because as someone said, things never things change but don't seem to change or they go backwards. But it's also inspiring because it shows us what what can happen. Thank you so much. Um, so it's interesting to hear the three of you talk about the, the different sort of struggles and, and um, also what you appreciate about the, the process, the anxieties. I've had the experience of looking at something that I had written in that book maybe 10 years before and then reading it a second time and understanding it in a totally different way because of the things that I've learned in that in that decade. And so, you know, this is maybe writ large uh, for the profession too. Um, so let's move on to our third question. And uh, you, son, I'm hoping you can take this first. Um, what have you been able to demonstrate through your work? What makes you excited about historical mm -hmm. research? 
Um, I think, you know, I've been able to um, uh, uncover some histories that have not been um, covered in our uh, social welfare histories. Um, so aside from that, I mean, sort of thinking about it more um, holistically, I think what I've hoped that I've been able to cover is that both social work's insistence on its um, professional innocence and um, its own sense of inadequacies are both um, incorrect. Um, that we've had far more influence and thus far more responsibility than we're actually, um, uh, we tend to take credit for or, or you know, take a responsibility for in, in a sense. So, and that social workers um, as you know, purveyors of, of direct services and really hugely involved in things like the New Deal um, have been social engineers um, in ways that I think we don't recognize and that we don't do enough work um, to really uncover. And part of that is that um, I keep uncovering really um, unflattering stuff. Um, so, you know, my latest discoveries have been about, or something that uh, Mimi said just reminded me, it was um, thinking about what histories are omitted, but also um, I, I just came across these documents where um, Virginia Robinson and Jesse Taft, who are really big figures, especially University of Pennsylvania, um, were trained at the, um, the Cold Spring Harbor um, eugenics laboratories as, as field workers. And if you look at their biographies, it'll say they were field workers and, and leave out the word eugenics, right? So, and this really doesn't appear in, in our um, history. So um, I think really what I would love people to take away from my work is that, you know, good intentions notwithstanding, we were uh, and are always people of our times and that, um, that we don't stand somehow um, outside the boxes or in the, in the margins in those ways that make us kinder and gentler and, and less responsible. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that was a, a reasonable answer. What makes me excited is um, I like doing the detective work. I like um, going down the rabbit holes and finding this one document. Um, I like going to somewhere, uh, an archive and finding something and being able to trace it. And more than anything, I like being able to answer some of my own queries about how did we get here? Why do we do the things we do? And why do we do them in the particular ways that we do them? Um, and to, you know, and, and I'm never satisfied with the answers. And so, because there's always something else that I should learn, but um, it's never boring. <laughs> Exactly, never boring. And and you uh, talk with your students too. I, I would imagine that that imparting in that sort of that kind of conversation. Thank you so much, Yusuf. Um, let's uh, move along to Mimi. Then, what have you been able to demonstrate through your work? What makes well, you excited? I think is you know I probably already said this, but I look at the structure of oppression built into social policy in the welfare state. If I had to summarize it. I would say that. Um, so we know the welfare state regulated the lives of women. It keeps them in their place, but it does it differently. White women are through a whole bunch of um, rules that keep them economically dependent on men. Think of social security, TANF, and all these other, I studied the rules of those very carefully, the rules and regulations, and they all have a, uh, they're deliberately gendered in this way. But for black women, it was different. Black women, because of poverty and racial discrimination and racism were forced to work. So they were denied access to the patriarchal pedestal that white women were placed on um, and that was used to keep white women in their place. So we had two different forces, patriarchy and racism working slightly differently depending on race. Um, so, uh, so I think one of the things I've concluded is that by reproducing racism and heterosexism and, and patriarchal arrangements, embedded in wider society. The welfare state is a product of the society in which uh, it is a part of. The welfare state placed people of color and white people, and in this case, women, on different footings in ways that fell especially hard and unfairly on poor women of color. And so that's, there's more discussion about that today, but when I started writing, no one was writing about the race and gender together, at, barely at all. Um, so. What have I demonstrated? I, I went, I started to think, okay, 
So I looked at the titles of my book. So that's what I demonstrated. Okay, taxes are a women's issue. I have a book on, on that. And then another one, um, then regulating the lives of women. I've demonstrated how that works. Um, and now I'm working on gendered obligations, which is the history of activism among working class women, black and white. Um, and uh, and the other thing that I, I, I think I demonstrated other people have too, but not so much in social work, that low-income women are feminists. People didn't study low-income women or poor and working class women. They didn't think because they weren't fighting for the ERA or they weren't fighting for equal rights with men, it wasn't the top of their agenda, that they weren't feminist. Um, but so they had their own, but I discovered they had their own feminist agenda that was different from the middle class agenda. And it was a, the, link, the link between being a woman the gendered obligations, which what women are expected to do, that's what that phrase means to me, and uh, economic and social justice. And they put th those together in a way that middle-class feminists, including some, not all, but many of the social reformers did, did not do. So we're acknowledging and claiming um, their feminism as well. Um, did I, did, I think that's, that's the end of that question, right? <laughs> yes, thank you, Mimi. That was wonderful. It, it, and so, Susan, let's have let's have you finish us off here with this. What have you been able to demonstrate, and what makes you excited? History at times is the kind of work that perhaps we do in general. In some ways, that it, it's not always easy to see where it lands uh, at all. But I, I do hope that the work that I have done offers some fresh insights and some fuel for critical analysis and, and a different ways of thinking about things. I think we're pushing all the time against sort of historical amnesia in the field and in general. And I, I keep thinking about Bell Hooks talking about her work being as an engagement in the struggle of memory against forgetting yeah. in, in a very potent um, way and she handles that of course in a whole range of has handled it in a range of different ways but I think history critical histories feminist histories are, are part of the struggle for memory against forgetting and I just want to sort of mention um, you you raised the issue Jessica of teaching I actually think a lot of the influence for working historians in the discipline is through the teaching that we do as well as through the things that we publish or the pieces of writing that we put out into the world. But I think some of the most powerful work that I've probably done has been through sitting with you, son, for several weeks and concocting an amazing course that still exists at the University of Washington and that hundreds of students have gone through who have dreaded it and then been amazed by their own um, learning journeys in the, in the class around history, social justice, theories of politics and policy. Um, and who, who first get angry, why didn't I know this? Because of the critical histories that we teach and then empowered, now that I know, I can't unknow. Yeah. And then it's a platform for action. So I, I, I would like to make sure that we also acknowledge the importance of teaching mm -hmm. and teaching history. And I know we'll come back to that. Oh, well, thank you so much. I just I, I, the the theme uh, that I'm noticing among the three of you is the, the importance of um, the intellectual journey and actually um, intentionally pushing back against sort of preconceived ideas. Um, the historical amnesia is really uh, fascinating. I know Mimi in the past has said thinking is practice, and sometimes in social work we're not really encouraged to think very deeply or perhaps look historically or really question ideas. Maybe history really offers a place where that's um, really um, promoted. So moving on to our next question, Mimi, I'm wondering if you could ask, uh, answer, why is historical research important for the profession of social work? Is there something about the present time that makes this especially urgent? Well, this of course is a question that the Social Effort History Group has been dealing with. So, um, so I'll start by saying that uh, I think we all think that history is a storehouse of information about people in society, that social work is mandated to mediate and improve change. So, and I think everyone has been basically saying that in different ways. And history of the past informs the present and the future in good ways and bad. But it's historical research is important because as already been indicated, we lack an accurate record. Most social workers lack any knowledge of the profession. 
period. And, and, and then um, and the existing historical accounts are filled with omission, biases, and distortions, especially related to marginalized groups. Um, and, um, and there's a growing number of persons of color in social work, CSWE just put out statistics on that, and they are demanding, that's, and that's students and faculty, and they are demanding that social work comes to terms with our, our troublesome history. Um, so we're talking here, I want to make one distinction that we're talking about was the history of social work, which I do less about, and, and the history of the welfare state, which I do more about. So we, we, I think the same issues apply, the same critiques apply to both, but I just want to make it clear that we're talking about these two different tracks, um, importantly. So first, it's, it's, it's an inaccurate record, and then it's an in, incomplete record, um, this is again on the profession. Important debates about the content of the curriculum, the role of field work, which method should we focus on, and, and the role of history. Um, we, we don't hear about them. They don't inform our current understanding and decision making. We, we don't know about the, strug or the, the struggles that social work has in, encountered. Um, our victories and our losses. What have what have what have we accomplished? What have we not accomplished? Um, and also, we know a little bit, and I think this has also been referenced, how we complied with or resisted prevailing trends. So we, you know, now some of that is the people in this room are starting to uncover some of that, but it's really. Um, I think I don't, this notion of the, I, I'm not a Foucault reader, so I learned a lot just listening today, but this, the innocence of social work, I love that phrase, um, because it, um, that's, that's kind of what I'm, I'm talking about here. Um, um, and so, and I would think it's fair to say that social work has marginalized history for years. This is the topic that the social welfare history group has just taken up. And, um, and for example, um, I found some data on the uh, production of historical dissertations. 13% of all dissertations were historical in 1950. That year, um, that same year, social work organizations, it may have been CSWE and others, at some conference and meeting about developing the social work agenda, ruled that including history, ruled, ruled, ruled out including history in the curriculum. It didn't belong in the curriculum. That, and then in 1995, not surprisingly, only 1.5% of the dissertations were historical. And that's based on work by Bob Fisher and one other person whose name I can't remember right now. Um, but that's the latest available data that I have in 1995. Maybe it's gone up a little, given the work that we're hearing about now, but it's probably still way below the 1950s. And, um, so what, what happened here is that without training faculty, through the PhD programs to become history informed researchers and teachers and practitioners, we don't have a pipeline of faculty to teach. And thus we have lack of historical content, which has also been documented by Michael Reich and others about the historical content uh, in courses, um, uh, historical courses and historical content in other courses. And so the, the, there's very few history courses in MSW and BSW programs these days. And um, so history is becoming extinct in social work. And it's, it's a deep worry. Um, and the current CSW competencies don't help because they don't really press for more historical content. How can you measure, how can you quantify, which is what the competencies do, um, uh, historical content, it's not a behavior. Um, and then we enter the neoliberal period, starting in the mid '70s, and this it, its emphasis on productivity, efficiency, accountability, and standardization, or bringing the business model into our work, intensified the problems, with, because it, it, it adopted and complied with the business model in both social work education and practice. I did a study with a colleague on the impact of um, a num in the, uh, managerialism or neoliberalism. In, the, in nonprofit human service agencies, and it's really a problem. Let me just add this today. If anyone saw the New York Times today about doctors, the demoralization of doctors, you must read it, it's an, an editorial. That is the same thing's happening in social work. It's the same thing we found in our study. We talked about it in different ways, but it's the same thing. They're leaving the field because they don't like the way practice and education is being conducted. Anyway, um, so, 
in this neoliberal era, era, historical research is considered unscientific, not scientific enough. Um, students are discouraged from writing historical dissertations because they, uh, it, it, they'll have trouble on the job market. That's something we can change if we create enough interest. Um, so our webinar, I just want to mention it in, uh, last April, I guess it was, um, 272 people registered from all walks of social life, work life. We were stunned that that number of people were interested from from social work practitioners to deans of schools of social work. About half of them attended, as is usual, and all were upset were about the marginalization of history um, in social work education, all of them. And we, we and this follow-up work being done, which we can talk about. Thank some. you very much. Thanks so much, Mimi. Appreciate that overview. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Susan, if you would like to add uh, to that, why, you know, why is it important for social work to study your own history? <laughs> We've probably talked around this in a number of different ways um, already in terms of this importance of sort of knowing where you've been to in order to be able to look forward in some ways. Um, Helen Harris Perlman at the University of Chicago wrote, her last book was called Looking Back to See Ahead, as I recall. And um, in many ways, the, your sub question was, is there anything about the present time that makes history especially urgent? I'm not sure if it's especially urgent, but I think it is urgent. I think it is urgent that we um, fearlessly really look at many of the things that you've since been talking about, which is these complexities, contradictions, um, occlusions in what we've done, many of which we rather thoughtlessly carry forward, I think, if we're not careful. Um, we haven't yet talked about whose histories and who's writing the histories, and I think that's a critical issue we should probably come back to before the end of this uh, webinar. But I was, um, and, and Iris Carlton and A um, is just a towering figure in this work of counter histories and counter narratives that that also tell us um, not only what we've deliberately marginalised, but also a lot about the potential for reparation. Um, there's a wonderful young um, scholar now at the University of British Columbia, Tina Wilson, who, who writes about histories as a go to justice. Mm. That, that, that we can use um, good critical histories, good feminist histories, good histories by scholars of color, critical race informed um, th histories as a, as, as a so we They're discomforting and they're inspiring, Tina says. And that's where her notion of histories is a go to justice or that it's fuel for a justice imagination. Yes. And the profession certainly needs, has that, but needs to nurture it, sustain it and activate it uh, in a range of ways it doesn't necessarily do. Um, sitting in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in a um, country with a, a, a deep, in, deeply and deeply imperfect uh, commitment to and realization of work on decolonization, I, th I think there's also a really critical role for history around epistemic justice mm -hmm. and decolonizing work. Um, because we literally, as, as you has said, silence and actually Mimi as well, silence and refuse knowledges that fall outside the canon. Indigenous knowledges, knowledges of people of color, trans, knowledge of LGBTQ um, disabilities, all of the, this, we know the whole range of things that we say, not really interested, even if we pay lip service to it. So I would just add those two things around histories of uh, counter histories and counter narratives, which anybody who hasn't read Iris Carlton and A's work and the work of her students, I encourage you to go back to that. And also the work of Tina Wilson and then work on coming up from a whole range of uh, indigenous and other scholars on decolonizing and epistemic justice work, um, yeah. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, you, Sun, would you like to add to that? Um, I, yeah, I just had a couple of things, which is, um, you know, what I think to me, um, as I said, what inspired me was to do a history of the present. And so every time I'm writing a new topic, um, I feel like there's some New York Times article that actually shows that it's actually, you know, alive and well in our present day um, circumstance. So, 
Um, I don't feel like anything I actually write about is the past, but it's it's very much the present. But to uh, to to go to what Susan was saying, for me, this work is about um, epistemic justice. Um, so we cannot actually. So I'm, I'm mindful of probably quoting Foucault way too much today, but um, his sense of history, which was that what he said was, um, I'm not interested in um, writing the true history. I'm interested in um, interested in writing the history of truths. So whose truths, what are the truths, what gets to be truths, so what gets to be facts about our history? What is our past? Um, who were we? How did we do these things? So that kind of um, uh, nudge, contestation of, of um, dominant epistemology um, um, necessitates historical analysis. Um, so I think that's, really the thing and, and the other part is just like really at, at a different sort of level of, of obviousness is that I mean all of Trump's immigration policies were repetitions of stuff that happened in the 1920s um, so we keep doing these things over and over and over and one of the things I'd like to tell social workers is to read some histories you know it'll save time um, on the outrage because you know what's coming um, so um, it's it, you know, because I sort of feel like we spend a whole lot of time thinking, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening when, yes, this is happening. It's happening. I mean, it's, it's not a um, an unknown factor in a sense. So but the epistemic justice part is, I think, what is to me the most important um, part of all this. Fantastic. So this this idea of uh, knowledge is power and who has the power to create the knowledge that then creates the power and on and on. And, and so the justice epistemic epistemic justice. Um, something for us to center in the profession. Let's let's move along. I see our time. This is a wonderful conversation. Um, uh, Susan, I'll have you start us off with this one. Do you believe your work has influenced social work practice? And in what ways? I think I, I would, uh, the writing, I hope so. Um, I don't know, <laughs> really, <laughs> except that now that people are suddenly discovering climate change, my long, complaint about social work having overlooked environmental issues is, is suddenly not new news to anybody anymore. Um, uh, and it's certainly topical. Um, so you do see ideas come around, but they, they get filtered through so many things, you don't know quite where the influence lies. I really do think that our work, bringing our work into teaching, and I know there's a lot of questions coming forward um, from the audience, but also that they include, you know, what are we teaching? How are we teaching it? How do we make space for people to come up who are interested in this? Um, I, I think we we have to somehow have courage and build that space out more. Mimi started us off with thinking about the sort of watered down things that are perhaps in our current guidelines. And um, I, I hope that at least those generations of students, master students, <laughs> other students are carrying forward some of this sort of historical, critical, contextual sensibility into their work and saying, it might be what you're doing, but why? <laughs> and what does it mean? And what comes with it? And what are, what, what are the legacies of some of this when it's happened before? Um, so I, I, who knows, um, but one hopes so. And I think there's multiple perhaps pathways that that, that influence can potentially happen, Jessica. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, Yusun, how about you? Has your work influenced social work practice? Well, I mean, just to go back to Susan for a minute, I wouldn't be doing the work I do now without Susan. Um, so I think, yes, I mean, at least in one scholar's work, you've definitely had a huge influence. Um, I mean, I think that I have, uh, some of my work um, has force people to change their histories of social work in, in some ways, um, because it just wasn't there before. Nobody had written about it since the 1940s or whenever. Um, but I think Susan's right. And, and what I'm really most interested in is um, this: the anti-CRT people aren't wrong. Um, corrupting young minds is a really powerful thing. So being able to influence the way people think um, and, and to really have them sh you know, shift their heads just a little bit about what kinds of questions to ask and, and how, to, um, how do you even see something, right? What is the context in which you actually analyze something? Those are really powerful forces. And um, I mean, I think my work 
does get read a lot in um, courses. So, you know, it's funny because we don't um, in social work have a metric for um, what I call teachability, um, the teaching influence. We have impact factors for uh, citations, but not for how many times your, your articles get used in teaching, right? Which I think for all three of us, um, which is uh, is something that um, we've been able to do. So there's that. Um, yeah, and I think, who knows? I'm Susan is right, and I don't know what my influence has been. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yusa. Uh, Mimi, how about you? Okay, I just want to go back to the, que the question of why now, just to, as a preface to this. Um, so, um, so we know that interest. We've we've known that there's a resurgence of interest in history in the in society now among our students. They want to know more about what what's going on today. They want to know more about the past, and this this is it's not a it's not unknown that when times are tumultuous, interest in history increases. Um, as today, because they want to understand the present, and I think this has also been said by here by checking out the past, and so that's what's happening. And today's turbulence is forcing social work, as I think we've gone over here many times already today, to reckon with its role in history, its compliance with the systems of oppression, especially systemic racism. So I think that's you know part of what's going on now. And in terms of my own influence. Um, well, I want to second the notion about teaching. I hadn't thought about it in the context of this discussion, but you know, probably taught more people over the many years I was a faculty member than read any of my works. <laughs> so you know, you never know where your publications go, but you have 25, 30 students and with larger classes, even more students. You know, I might challenge that, Mimi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I might challenge that. <laughs> If they're forced, they're forced to listen to us, though. Okay, the reading is a little bit more voluntary left at the time, but thank you anyway. So I think teaching, yes, I think, and I we all bring history into our classrooms, no matter what we talk about. Um, I want to say that the, the early feminist histories of the welfare state were an early corrective of the kind that we're talking about, because most of those histories have, were, were written by white men, and the feminist histories began to challenge that. Uh, that voice, that perspective on what the welfare state was all about and brought women into view because the men never even discussed women at all. So uh, there is a feminist corrective. It was an early one of the kind we're talking about. And now there's been a more racial, a racial corrective, I think has been added to that in, in large numbers. Um, and I, if I can say that Linda Gordon said that my book, Regulating the Lives of Women, was the first full-length feminist discussion of the welfare state. But that, of course, if you all know Linda Gordon, that, that just, you know, made me blush, but also made me fly high. Um, so so that was, that's sort of, it. she said that about 15 years, you know, when the book first came out in the late 80s. Um, and then I, I just... Um, it came across a quote when I said, okay, have I, influ we, we all think, we, no one knows what influence they have. So we're trying to grab at straws of what we think might be signs of our influence. So that's what I came up with. But um, I also came up with um, uh, this, well, was a student once said to me that my gender analysis changed her lives. Many students that changed their lives. It, it's the impact that students say, oh my God, I didn't know that about what happened to me as a woman. And, th and then one woman said it changed the sense of herself as a woman. So of course that, that's what you want to have happen over and over again. Well, at least one person mentioned that to me. So I'll end on that. <laughs> Happy note. That's wonderful, Mimi. And I will say that your article on the divisions of welfare, the kind of the re discussion of Richard Titmus and, and the divisions of welfare and you know occupational welfare and you know fiscal welfare, that was like taking the blue pill in the Matrix movie. You know, you never see the world the same way again. So um, yeah, so thank you for that. That was a typical question, and I know it was going to be a difficult question. You, you handled it really well. It's tough to um, articulate, but I think uh, teaching is certainly an unrecognized um, facet of this for historians. Uh, we are running a little bit short of time, so. I'm hoping that uh, with this last question, we can go sort of fast. We can give some time for our Q&A. Um, so the Social Welfare History Group is concerned about the dwindling pool of social work scholars who conduct historical research um, due to retirements and little support for young scholars to replenish the ranks. Um, do you believe that it's important to have scholars from within the social work profession itself uh, um, um, to understand themselves and study themselves and why, uh, if that's true? Um, and 
are there other reasons why the profession should be promoting historical education and research? It's a big question, I know, but if we could maybe do a few sentences and then we'll move to questions. And you, Sun, let's start with you. I think you're on mute again, you, Sun. No discipline worth its name does not have a historical wing that examines its own uh, motivations and, and actions is one thing, but you know, there's so many things that we need to understand about um, why, what the structures are. I think, I mean, I mean, I think I've mentioned some of this, but look at productivity metrics, look at um, journal page lengths, look at what kinds of tracks you can actually put in um, papers into something like uh, SWER. Um, there's no history, history tract, as you, as you well know. Um, look at the requirements for funding to get hired. So here's a challenge to all the deans out there at the very wealthy schools of social work. Commit to hire one historian per school. And I'm not talking about the state schools who can't afford it, but I'm talking about places like University of Washington, Michigan, um, Penn. Commit to hire one person. Um, and you could have... 20 historians in the field because I don't think the shortage is in, um, in any interest in up and coming scholars. The shortage is in our inability to actually, um, you know, ethically train them to, to go into this field in many ways. But, but I want to really think about the structural um, constraints of things like um, paper page lengths. Um, because I don't think that's where our heads go generally, um, but there are uh, systemic constraints. Um, and I'll, I'll just stop there. Thanks so much. Wonderful examples, really concrete. Um, Mimi, how about you? Well, um, you some you've mentioned about four of the things that came out of the social welfare history webinar that the group has taken up as recommendations to try to materialize um, all, all these structural constraints. And then there's also the attitudinal constraints that you can't get a job if you study history, that it isn't important, it isn't scientific. And those attitudes shape these barriers that you've identified. And then the field sort of all agrees that, well, we probably shouldn't do this, it's a waste of time. And so all the arguments that we've made here for the past hour go unheard or never even get raised because it's, they're dismissed on, you know, at first glance. So, um, so that is to say, yes, we need social work, social workers to be his, uh, scholars of history. We need more scholarship on this. And we need to make sure that um, it gets into the practice clauses as well. And, the, and the it has relevance for practice, both in teaching and in research, how to translate this, the history of Maybe someone should know the history of Mary Richmond a little more, and that should be something. Or and other social workers who, you know, did many different things as part of the casework class. What about the, the, the debates between the different schools of social work? Shouldn't that be the method? Shouldn't that be part of the? It's not included. We're we're so much. Our classes are so much how to and not how to think. And as Jessica reminded me, I often say thinking is practice because I'm told in some of my activist circles, oh, you, you, you can't talk about threats to democracy. You have to talk about what you're gonna do about it. And so you, you get, you know, and that's, that's very much a social work attitude towards, that, that also shapes our attitudes and practice towards history. Thank you, Mimi. Susan, how about you wrap it, wrap it up for us in a nice bow? I think the answer to, to do we need social work scholars who do history is yes. <laughs> so I think we're all agreed on that. I don't think they have to necessarily be social workers themselves. I think they have to be in schools of social work. Mm -hmm. And there's only a handful of schools that have got the capacity to do that kind of interdisciplinary hiring, but they should be doing it. And they have done it in the past and it's enriched the, the field and the discipline and those schools. Um, I had a, another point that I wanted to make around, but I, I think I can come back to it through Q&A, um, just in the interest of time, Jessica. So yes, absolutely. And um, we can talk through, I know the questions have a lot of sort of, goodness me, how do we actually make this happen? How might I make it happen kind of questions, so. <laughs> Thank you okay. so much. Um, so th thank you very much, panelists, for that portion of the program. And I see we have a lot of uh, great questions. I'm going to start us off with this one from an anonymous attendee. 
Um, uh, I notice a lot of the scholars are senior scholars and, and my partner is an academic historian. And I know that the requirements for tenure for a historian and a social work scholar are way different. I'm just curious um, how you all navigated the pathway toward tenure with your work. Um, any advice for young social work scholars who are navigating high productivity and grant requirements and or high teaching loads? Well, I'll say something because I often have to address that. Um, first of all, times have changed. When, when I was going for tenure, and maybe when some of the people here were going for tenure, it's very different than it is now because that whole neoliberal managerial thing was in its infancy. And so the, the pressures were different. So, so I, was a, I feel like I was very fortunate. I was able to follow my interests. Around me, people were saying, oh, get on someone's grant because then you'll get it done faster, and even if you were not interested in the topic and so on. So that's what you encourage, or you encourage to go for NIH grants um, that are behavioral health and, and that takes you away from history or even maybe your own interests. So I say, if you can or possible, follow your interests and make them work for you. And you know, you may have to, you know, bend here and bend there, but you, you can turn a historical dissertation or history informed dissertation into something that meets today's requirements. If you just find someone to, to mentor you and to, and to work it out. So, but if you just don't do something you don't wanna do because you will never finish that. Well, you'll never finish a dissertation. And if you do and you get tenure and you have to teach from your research that you've done previously, you will be teaching things that you're not interested in. Anyone else like to add to that? Thank you, Mimi. Okay. I'll just jump in because I, I having been at a, at a research one, um, I, I really um, do just tend to say sort of with a bit of a chagrin laugh often, I have done history more with my left hand than with my right often. I've had to actually build a portfolio that had a mix of things in it. Um, centered around some core interests, which I think is also what you're saying, Mimi. You have to do what you care about. You have to do what, what I, I hate to say brings you joy, given that <laughs> how tainted that phrase is, but um, at least that, that you, you, have a, you care about, that can, can be the through line in your, in your work and figure out how things cohere, because if it's incoherent, then that doesn't work for tenure either. But um, there may be multi-methods ways. And I just want to mention the word transdisciplinarity. I think there's a lot of, whether you think it's a buzzword or not, there is a lot more opportunity for mixed scholarship, not just mixed methods, but cross-discipline for people like me who cross humanities and social sciences to find spaces for themselves to work in some really interesting ways with other people. Um, and I would encourage people interested in finding pathways towards tenure that combine, that do have an historical lens in them at least to think about that as well. Okay, I'm going to uh, switch from the scholarship to maybe more of an activist mode question here. Um, one attendee says, at this point in time, do you believe that it is most effective to join the system, and, or, and maybe this could be in any system, to create significant change, or is it most effective to change the system from the outside? <laughs> Very big question. Well, okay, that, and th there's a, a long history of that. That question has been debated since I don't know, 1890 maybe, I don't know when, but it, it used to be called reform or, re or revolution, um, change from within or change from without. Um, and I don't have an answer to that. It's not a simple answer. I would say it depends on what the issues are, what the times are, what's going on, what's the political context, your political resources, your political capac capacity. But I will also say that I think some of the major changes we have in the welfare state in this country came during the years between 1935 and the post-war period between uh, the New Deal and neoliberalism. And what was different about those periods is we had active, active social movements. They call it pressure from below. They pressed on the government, they pressed on the public, they changed public opinion. And so that was the outside pressure. It may not have been revolutionary in someone's definition of the term, but it was it was pressure from without. And without that, 
the people inside probably wouldn't have accomplished as much as they did. So maybe you have to think of it as a partnership between the insiders and the outsiders, and they, they have to collaborate. Thank you, Mimi. You I want to, yeah, I want to actually just challenge the question itself. Um, and, you know, it's, I'm not really sure where the outside is, um, and I'm not entirely sure where the inside is. So the sort of, I mean, in some ways, my previous comment about social work innocence is I think we're always seeking to find a place that is outside. Um, you know, it's, it's that can put us in a place that of, um, um, I don't know, more, more moral, more something. Um, and I don't know that that is the right question, actually. Um, to dichotomize um, social work, social work is very much part of society. And we are very much a profession that constructs um, ideas about how society should function and what families should look like, what, what individuals should do, what is healthy and what is not healthy. So I'm not sure where the outside or the inside is. And I, I, I get the impulse of the question, but I guess I don't have an answer either, except to say, let's read, maybe we should rethink that. Um, what's, what's the impulse behind that question is, is uh, what I would say. Interesting. Uh, it reminds me of the environmental uh, saying that the environment is not just outside of us, it's actually within us. Maybe social work is, you know, we're, we're not just outside social work. Maybe maybe social work is outside or you, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> well, I mean, even the, even, the, yeah. even the very notion of what the environment is, is a construction, right? That so that it's not like there's the uh, environment and here's us and somehow we are separate from that environment. So perhaps challenging those ideas about um, those kinds of dichotomous thinking, maybe, I think would be helpful for social work is, is you know, just a yes. thought. Thank you very much, Yusun. Um, So I, I'd like to move on to maybe ed, to education and, and let's see where, how this goes. Uh, Lauren uh, asks, in what ways do you see social work education, MSW and BSW, perpetuating a limited understanding of social work histories, uh, perhaps critical histories? And how do you think this impacts students understanding the profession and subsequently how they practice social work? Okay. Maybe I can. Oh, off you go, Mimi. Go I defer to you, Mimi. I was jumping in because I, I, I. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Mimi, and then Susan. Or, oh, so, sorry, Susan, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I think that you know, inherent in that is sort of a, a thought that perhaps many social work programs do have very limited space for history, and then what they do teach is. A little, I, I, I don't want to be totally dismissive of textbooks, but they, the potted kind of reductionistic summary that, that, that just is inevitable really in, in undergraduate text certainly. And, and often, um, I mean, that we have good, much better sort of resources available to us in different ways, but I must say, I have tried to resist teaching social work history through, um, uh, textbooks alone and, and textbooks at all at times in the and they have tried to do more with sort of primary source chunk, little chunks of primary sources um, wrapped around with scholars like Iris and you son and Mimi and others um, so that students get to read both the voices themselves and then critical histories um, that wrap around those voices rather than sort of potted histories and then we at the University of Washington had students exploring historical questions that they care about in small ways, which resulted in some amazing projects, um, which is, you know, pretty amazing over a period of 10 weeks in itself. So uh, I, I think you have to be creative and you have to push against the sort of received histories that often are what resides in textbooks. Mimi, would you like to? Well, oh, okay, I, I really, lost track of what I was going to say, but I was reminded of, um, uh, that is why I deferred to you, Susan, because I couldn't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> but, um, you, you know, when I, at Columbia, I had, in, both in the master's and in the doctoral program, 
Al Khan, some of you may remember him, taught the history and philosophy of social welfare. And I should have mentioned that at the beginning because that was one of the first courses I had. And um, it's one of the things that turned me on to the history of the welfare state and the profession because it opened, it did open my eyes in the ways that I think people have been responding to history uh, today. So, so if the question was, is it important to have some history in social work education? To me, that was an example of having that as a course. And I know in my own course, I chaired the social policy area for many years and slowly history got reduced in its place in the in the syllabus because we had to add so many other things. It just is curriculum space is a major issue and history gets pushed out. So what I did instead was bring history into every topic that I was talking about, you know, even if only as reference to it. Um, and we don't have any, we didn't have any history courses and the social policy courses, which is that introduction to social policy um, is no longer the history and philosophy of social welfare, but it, it had one unit now it, you know, it's, it, if it gets in there, it's lucky. So I think that um, that's the marginalization of history. It's a serious problem. Um, and people, if you're history blind and you walk through life without knowing what everyone said, where you came from and whose voice you're listening to, um, you're bound to make mistakes in your work as well as being uh, unhappy. <laughs> so um, this, this maybe last question, uh, it comes from an anonymous attendee who says, I am a first year social work PhD student and very keen to incorporate historical scholarship into my career, but I am feeling overwhelmed by the breadth of the field and wondering where to begin. And as social work scholars, has the breadth of the field been in conflict with the depth that your historical work requires? Well, for any historical topic, you've got to pick a little bit of the story and dig in. Every topic is broad. I mean, all the topics that the welfare state, immigration, all these, they're, they're huge stuff. You've got to take a slice of it and, and um, look into it. And also, Jessica, you might want to mention the Social Welfare History Group doctoral program doctoral group that we've started. Um, if you're interested in, go ahead, why don't you mention that? And because maybe people could um, would be interested in joining. Yeah, well, as Mimi just said, there is the social, the uh, social welfare history group has a doctoral group that PhD doctoral group that's meeting uh, Justin Hardy and uh, Mimi uh, bring it together. And so if you wanted to contact um, uh, Mimi or Justin or myself actually you can contact myself and I will send you in the right direction if you're a doctoral student. And it's, it, it's just getting started and um, it's, it's, it's meant to answer just the type of question that was answered. How do I do historical research? How do I deal with the issues that come up from someone who's just beginning to think about it all the way to someone's in the middle of their dissertation on history? Thank you. You're I mean, something. yeah, I mean, I, I guess like Mimi's right. I think that you you start somewhere, right, with a topic, a, a small slice of something. And and I tended to have um, started with some passing phrase that I find in a journal, uh, like um, Americanization. Wait, that, that doesn't sound good. Um, what is it? How is that different from assimilation? But you know, I mean, this project on Americanization, I thought was going to be about a very limited movement, and then I realized is really about what do we think an American is and what, what, is that, what does it mean to be America? So it's, it's grown, but I guess the question I would ask about that question also is, I think it depends on why do you wanna incorporate historical scholarship? Um, so what, what, again, what's the, what's the drive there? Because I think for me, I think, of course, I think it's important to you know, incorporate historical scholarship, but for me, the, the, the history, was so that I could um, do a very particular type of um, epistemological decentering. So um, I think it really depends on what they want to do um, and and why they're interested in the historical scholarship. Um, because to me, uh, trying to find this is what actually happened is um, not such an interesting um, endeavor as much as um, trying to figure out what you're trying to figure out actually. So for, for doctoral students, I would say, if you're interested in history and if you feel like it, that's great. I'm happy to talk to anybody if you wanna email me, but also really just sort of try to um, investigate what, what actually is your interest in this. Um, yeah. What's your motivation? How does it inform your work? 
what do you want it to do? I mean, like, you know, what's, what is, uh, yeah, that's. Thank you. Question with a question. Good question. <laughs> that's very good. Susan, is there anything you'd like to add to this? I think in the interest of time, I, I, I think um, I, I'm delighted to hear about the doctoral student interest group. And certainly I think any of us who do feel passionate about history will be more than happy to feel questions from people because we really are sort of feeling desperately worried about sustaining this important part of the field. So be in touch. Well, um, I, I just want to thank our panelists for your um, wonderful comments, for letting us inside your minds and your, your stories um, and how you come to your work. Um, I hope this highlights the importance of historical research and, and why we care about it at Affilia, the Social Welfare History Group. And um, with that, I am now going to say thank you to our panelists, and I will introduce um, Dr. Barbara Levy-Simon, who is going to give us final remarks. Thank you so much, panelists. Um, so to introduce Dr. Barbara Simon, um, she has taught full-time at the Columbia School of Social Work from 1986 to 2019, where she is now an emerita professor and special lecturer. Prior to 1986, she taught at LaSalle University in Philadelphia and Stony Brook University of the State University of New York. And for 25 years as an adjunct professor, she taught a course on community-based social work at the City University of New York. Her books include Never Married Women, The Empowerment Tradition and Social Work History, and The Columbia Guide to Social Work Writing. Simon's most recent journal publications have focused on the social work practice, community building, and ep uh, epistemology of the settlement house movement in New York City. She is currently immersed in research and writing that explores the forms of evidence called upon by practitioners and educators in the earliest journals of social work in the United States. We are honored to have you here, Dr. Simon, to provide summation of this amazing discussion and to offer some closing remarks. Thank you. And how exciting it is to continue to learn today from Drs. Toft, Abramovitz, Kemp, and Park. What a pleasure. Contextualizing any phenomenon or process is a primary duty of any feminist who works historically to provide additional context for today's highly thoughtful panel presentations and moderation. Let me begin with some bad news about historical study in our shared profession of social work. It is no secret that at least in the United States, fewer undergraduate students now than during the 20th century are majoring in liberal arts disciplines, such as history, political philosophy, anthropology, or literature. Core required liberal arts curricula at the undergraduate level are now few and far between. In part, the gutting of core requirements in the liberal arts in many community colleges, colleges and universities is part of a movement begun in the 1970s to transform students into consumers and to change universities into mere marketplaces in the US. Let the customers choose whatever they want to study has become a guiding ethos that has replaced an earlier approach in which educators required designated core courses for the first two years in community colleges and four-year colleges and universities, after which students then chose majors and electives for their last two years of undergraduate study. Meanwhile, State legislatures in the US are purposely shrinking funding for the liberal arts in public universities, with the sole exception of departments of economics. Some state legislatures and governors are directly forbidding through laws, executive orders, and state education departments, curricular and teaching mandates, discussions, videos, social media posts, cartoons, and books in public education that explore intersectionality, labor union history, critical race theory, excavation of the intimate links among African-American slavery, the Reconstruction era, the Jim Crow era, the Civil Rights Movement, and Black Lives Matter. Also the women's movement and debates about past and present refugee and immigration laws. In at least one state, Georgia, discussion of the history of Palestinians is now forbidden in undergraduate and graduate social work programs, um, sad to say. These trends mean that students in undergraduate and graduate social work programs in 2023 have had significantly less exposure than have students in the past to historical content 
and methods. In addition, social work scholars with PhDs who do not also have PhDs in history generally face major barriers in finding research funding for historical investigations. The National Institutes of Health and the US Department of Health and Human Services, among other funders, have demonstrated general disinterest in historical research proposals from social workers. However, happily, there is also plenty of good news, which some of our, our presenters and, and the moderator have already uh, briefly referred to. Um, and what is this good news? Indigenous North Americans are publishing and teaching regularly about social work's history of episodic attentiveness, along with white settler extermination and removal of Native Americans. Disability rights scholars within social work are opening our eyes to the multiple forms of historical stigma, stigma and institutional barriers to employment, mobility, full citizenship, and living with dignity. Feminist, eco-feminist, and womanist social workers working in an historical mode, mode excuse me, have unearthed the complex layers of misogyny undergirding girding official responses to violence against women and girls, child welfare and adoption regulations, inheritance laws, and commitment proceedings of wives and daughters into mental hospitals, involuntary commitments. African-American social workers and educators have contributed de decades of journal articles, books, social media posts, and webinars that are rooted in historical analyses of the profound and sustained racism and genetics in our history, as well as helping us to understand the many contributions of black social workers over time. Social work scholars are steadily enriching our understanding of social work practice and policies that affect Latino, Latina, and Latinx individuals, families, and communities. Asian, Asian American, and Pacific Islander social workers are enhancing social work students' grasp of the expropriation of poverty, property, and civil rights and of course the brute violence faced by many streams of immigrants and refugees who have come from the Middle East, South Asia, Central Asia, East and Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Islands. To sum up, feminist social workers who are conducting historical studies are swimming upstream, no question. Yet, we continue to get stronger, more visible, more prolific, and become more of a community despite the odds. Thank you.